Many of our viewers have probably heard the name Eidsatzgruppen, which associated with the SS and punitive actions. However, not everyone has a complete idea of what it is and why it was invented. In fact, the Eidsatzgruppen is the general name for a specially punitive military unit, a kind of headquarters divided into Einsatz detachments, which in turn were divided into Sonderkommandos, something like a brigade battalion company in conventional troops. The subordination of these special forces was twofold. Territorially, they had to coordinate their actions with local units of the SS, the Gestapo, the command of the Abwehr, and others. At the same time, all the Einsatzgruppen reported directly to the 4th Directorate of the RSHA, Imperial Security Service, which was headed by Muller. However, in addition to the Gestapo, the SD, military counterintelligence, also took part in the activities of Einsatzgruppen, the police and other military and special services depending on the need. The main task of all the Einsatzgruppen was to exterminate the enemies of the Reich, communists, Jews, gypsies, Slavs, partisans, members of the underground and simply discontented. The first Einsatzgruppe appeared back in 1938 after the Anschluss of Austria. That's what it was called, Einsatzgruppe Austria. Then the Einsatzgruppe for Czechoslovakia was created. In 1938, the Einsatzgruppe was established to, so to say, work in occupied Poland. However, the Einsatzgruppe gained its greatest distribution and scope after the Reich attack on the USSR. For operations on the territory of the USSR, four Einsatzgruppen were created at once, which were supposed to operate in the rear of army groups. In the rear of Army Group North, Einsatzgruppe A operated. In the rear of Army Group Center was Einsatzgruppe B. In the rear of Army Group South was Einsatzgruppe C. And in the rear of the 11th German Army and Romanian troops, in the very south of Ukraine and in the North Caucasus, Group D functioned. The composition of all the groups was what it called rebel, meaning that in addition to the SS and Waffen SS troops, there could also be units of field police, police formed from local collaborators, and if necessary, Wehrmacht units were also involved. On the territory of the USSR, communist leaders of Soviet authorities sympathetic to the Soviet regime, citizens who refused to comply with the demands of occupation authorities, and so on down the list, Jews, gypsies, non-local suspicious people, etc., they all were subject to physical extermination. It should be said that the Wehrmacht generals and officers were not very fond of the punishers, so sometimes friction and even conflicts arose. But as a rule, the last word remained with the Einsatzgruppen officers, since their units had powerful patrons in the person of Muller, Schellenberg, and Heydrich himself, and later Kelton Berner. The Eidsensgruppen headquarters were engaged in planning operations, distributing the location and degree of participation among their Sunday commandos. And then the hunt began. They hunted the partisans and all those who were suspicious and sympathetic to the partisans, even just random passers-by. Do not offend innocent people. There was no such point in the instruction of the punishers. On the contrary, the commanders and members of the punitive detachments were guided by the rule it is better to overdo it than to leave someone alive. In principle, all the Einsatzgruppen detachments and their Sonderkommandos acted according to the same rather primitive scheme. From local agents, there was information that partisans had been seen near such and such a village. The information as a rule was not verified. The Sonderkommando moved to this area and the inquiry of the locals began. Where is the partisan? was the standard question of the punitive forces. Are you a partisan? Who saw the partisans? You or you? You are lying dog. You are a partisan. That is, a question and an accusation were immediately mixed in one phrase. That was enough. People who did not understand what was going on were kicked out of their houses in the fall, into the mud, into the snow in the winter, sometimes without even being allowed to get dressed. And they were driven towards the forest shouting, come on, Ivan, Mashka, show me where the partisans are. After which they started shooting at people. Often the unfortunate people were taken out near the village, forced to dig a trench, then driven into it and shot. The village as a rule was burned. It was worse if a dead German soldier or even a local policeman were found near a village. The punitive forces entered the village early in the morning stealthily. They propped up the doors from the outside and set fire to the houses along with all the people there. Old people, women, children. They stood by the road and watched as people jumped out of the burning houses through the windows, first throwing out their children. 
The Sunder Commando members laughed and started shooting at people trying to escape the fire. This is how the Sunder Commandos had fun. Sometimes they ran into partisan ambushes, so they had to fight. Everyone knew that there would be no mercy from the enemy. But the partisans with weaker weapons had one advantage – the forest, which they knew like the back of their hand, and so if there was no other way, they could retreat and get lost from the pursuit of the punishers in their native wilds. It was easier in the summer, however, in winter it was much more difficult, since deep snow constrained and slowed down the speed of movement. In such cases, only skis saved them. The SS punishers knew that they could expect trouble near the forest, so they chose roads away from the forest thickets. Or they asked for armor from the authorities, armored personnel carriers and sometimes even tanks. The result was such an interesting situation. Punitive forces were rampaging through a populated area, and armored cars and tankets with Wehrmacht soldiers were stationed on the outskirts, providing protection for the Sunder Commando from a sudden attack by partisans. It also happened that the elite Abwehr training regiment Brandenburg 800 was sometimes brought in to help punitive forces to fight partisans. The purpose was to practice in a combat situation before being thrown into the Soviet rear. In addition to mass executions and burning of people, the Einsatz units also used the so-called gas vans, gas chambers. Trucks with a booth, supposedly adapted for transporting people. A hose from the engine exhaust pipe was let into it. People were driven into a booth under the pretext of transporting them to work or another place, and the door was locked from the outside. The driver, while driving, switched the toggle and exhaust gases began to fill the booth staffed with people. After 15-20 minutes, people were suffocating. From the testimony of the traitor, member of the center commando, Mikhail Eskov, when all the prisoners were placed in the gas chamber, Hans slammed the airtight door, connected the hose to the cabin, and revved up the engine. Dr. Kurtz got into the car. The engine roared, drowning out the knocks and screams of the dying, and the car drove out of the yard. Later, one of us began to push the corpses towards the door. Two of us, by the arms and by the legs, at random, threw the bodies into the pit. They fell on top of each other, and when they fell, they made a peculiar gasping sound. And it seemed as if the earth itself was groaning as it accepted the unfortunate victims. By the summer of 1943, the Eidsons and their local accomplices with help of the police and others had murdered at least a million of Soviet citizens of Jewish origin alone in the occupied Soviet territory. In total, the number of civilian casualties as a result of two years of activity by the Einsatzgruppen and their Sonder commandos reached two million people. The officers, as well as ordinary Sunder commandos, knew no mercy. Therefore, they did things that cannot fit into the head of a normal person. Take any insane atrocity. Make fun of the patients of a psychiatric hospital before killing them. Kicking a small child like a ball. Cutting off the head of someone suspected of helping partisans in front of the entire village. Raping all the women, including little girls, before driving them into a pit and shooting them. The Einsatzgruppen had no problems with their conscience when they did all this. And no matter how much time passes, the crimes committed by the Einsatzgruppen will never expire. And they will never receive forgiveness before the court of history.